How did it all start for you? What got you into running? Yeah, I actually got interested in it pretty early, but didn't really start taking it all that seriously until a little bit later. I did, I was exposed to endurance running in middle school when our class did this, uh, this, uh, physical education course, essentially called the presidential physical fitness, where you do all sorts of different like fitness tests. And one of them happened to be the mile run. And that was kind of my first exposure to just the difference between, you know, being good at say a distance event versus like sprinting or strength-based stuff. And it really stood out to me that the, the mile run was definitely my strength amongst all those tests we did. Uh, that kind of drove me kind of towards like the longer distance stuff when I did have opportunities to do those for like track and field day and, you know, random cross country meets and things like that. Um, until, uh, high school is when I started kind of more competing more seasonally, I would say. And then by my senior year, kind of started taking it a little bit more seriously yet, but college is where I really started or universities where I really started to, uh, uh, try to understand kind of the hows and whys of what I was doing and recognize that like, there's different training approaches and things like that. So, um, yeah, I would say like I got started in early age, but the progression was quite slow, which I find to be, I think, good for me from a long-term perspective. <laughs> How was your ultra marathon like? And what I mean by this is in two parts. The first one is going from a marathon and like keep going until you start embracing, okay, let's, let's keep going this and going longer. Yeah. So I think one thing I'd learned that really stuck out to me from college was, of the workouts that we would do, because we would do like basically everything along the intensity spectrum at some point in time. And the part of the process that I enjoyed the most was kind of building that foundation during the summer for, of just like kind of like longer, slower miles. And then uh, ultimately during seasons and things like that, the workout I looked the most forward to during the week was our Sunday morning long run. So uh, that was a little bit of maybe of an insight to me just towards where my like true passions were within the sport. Uh, after college, I started gravitating towards longer stuff, uh, in college or university, it was like 10 K was the furthest I could really race for on the team. And then after that, I did a few marathons, uh, sort of, uh, I would say kind of unstructured to most, for the most part in terms of the way I trained for them, but with a very heavy volume emphasis. And then, uh, I decided to jump into an ultra marathon in 2010, uh, about like maybe four months or so before before the race itself. So I did have some time to prepare for it, but my mindset at that point was like, let's just try this out. And then, you know, if I like it, maybe I'll start doing these more consistently years down the road. But I ended up liking it so much by that same time, the following year, I was doing just ultra marathons, basically from a peaking standpoint. When did you start seeing that you were much better at even longer distances? Yeah, you know, pretty soon. I mean, some of it's just like you get the longer you go, the, the thinner the number of people willing to even attempt them <laughs> are. So you can kind of, uh, you, you sort of have a situation where uh, the pool is a little bit smaller um, just from the nature of the sport and the rec the requirements to really do it from a time standpoint, a dedication standpoint. And then ultimately, there is going to probably be some unique physical characteristics that make someone like maybe better at, say, 100 miles than they would be at a marathon and vice versa. Uh, but yeah, pretty early on, I think I realized that that was something that I'd probably have a relative strength in. And um I, I sort of was getting to know that before ultra marathons though, even with doing some, some just longer training, I just recognized like I could tolerate like a huge volume of training. Like I was easily hitting hundred plus mile weeks without any issues injury wise. Whereas, you know, a lot of my peers and college teammates, when they would try to do that, they would run into a lot of hiccups with injury and things like that. So that was a little bit of an indication that I might be able to actually like um, potentially just put in a lot of, a lot of work relative to what the average person maybe would be able to do. And that would likely be of my benefit in a race that's very long, like a hundred miles. Um, by the time I knew it was something where I could like legitimately make a career out of was probably around the end of 2013. Uh, I did a race called the desert salsa's track invitational. And there I broke the American record for a hundred miles and the world record for 12 hours distance running in 12 hours. And, um, kind of gave me a little bit of a momentum along the lines of, uh, acquiring coaching clients, signing sponsorship deals and things like that. And, um, yeah, so that was probably the real turning point. How does the training for a top ultra marathon runner look like? So I think there's probably a fair bit of variety amongst, um, the, 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 the ultra runners out there. And some of that's just due to the nature of these events, having some difference where, you know, we say ultra marathon and it really could be anything from 50 kilometers up to like multiple days or sometimes weeks and months out end, depending on the event itself. And then you get the train aspect too. You might be doing like high mountain races versus like some of the stuff that I've done on like a 400 meter track. Uh, but for me, historically, what's worked the best has been 
to have like a really strong foundation, which is just a lot of kind of long, slow running for the most part. And that tends to stick around for a while. Once you develop it, you don't have to necessarily like beat yourself up over and over again to kind of sustain that. You just have to kind of maintain a, a version of what got you there, so to speak. And once I'm there, I start looking at what race I want to do. And once I know that I have like an idea of the intensity that I'm targeting on race day. So that's what I'm going to be building towards. And what I do from there is I'll work on anything that's kind of important, but least specific to the intensity that I'll be doing on race day. And then as I move through the plan, I'm getting more and more specific or shifting more of my training load towards the things that would be required on the race course itself. So since I'm training primarily for hundred mile races at this point, I'm sitting like still within what people would consider like your, the easy category of intensity. Um, it's below my aerobic threshold for the most part. And what that ends up meaning is early in my training plan, I might start doing like some short intervals that are pinned to a little bit of a higher intensity. Or for me, I usually pin it to like an intensity I could sustain for like a 12 minute type of like all out effort. And I'll do that for a while and let that adaptation occur. Then I'll kind of switch to doing more stuff that is at like uh, what people would consider like your threshold intensity or what I'll pin to about an effort that I could sustain for like 60 minutes in an all out intensity uh, or evenly paced for 60 minutes, race day setting type of thing. Uh, and I'll start to develop and acquire adaptations at that intensity. And then ultimately by the end of the plan, I'm going to skew almost all the speed work towards just developing volume at goal race intensity and usually kind of have some building out of what a lot of all trainers will call like back-to-back -back long runs. So, you know, that can be as much as like three, four hour runs on a Saturday and a Sunday to kind of end the week. Or if I'm doing like a flatter, more runnable course, you know, that could be easily 30, 30 plus miles on any one of those types of runs. So it gets really specific to what I'll be doing on race day. And, and that allows me to practice things like the fueling and hydration side of things that are going to be the most specific to what I need to do on race day as well and kind of mimic them as closely as possible in training. Do you do the, the whole distance throughout the week? And if so, how many times? So I, I don't usually train past, say, like four hours or like in the 30-ish mile range for the most part, unless I'm doing a race. Uh, partly just because like from a physiological standpoint, the adaptations are going to basically dis disappear after that point. So there's real no physical advantage to doing it. I think there's maybe some, some advantage for people to run, say, longer than that a few times during a training block if they're doing like a long race for the first time and they're just like a little nervous or have some anxiety about going as far as they're going to go. So like when I'm peaking and stuff like that, I might be running like 150 miles in a week, but I'll never say like run close to the race distance if I'm doing hundred miles in one effort. Uh, the reason being is just when you look at just the training load over the course of the entire plan and how that's going to play out over, over the entirety of it by doing like too much at once, what do you end up doing? Like if I would go and say run like a 60 mile long run, I could do it. And it would be an adaptation, but the amount of recovery it would probably take to bounce back from that 60 mile run would exceed the amount of training load I could acquire by doing something shorter and then getting back to training soon after and picking up where I would have still been resting kind of later in the plan. So I think there's some value to having a pronounced long run, but I think it's also, there's a limit to where it probably starts becoming a margin of diminishing returns in the sense that you take future training off the table if you do it. Do you train uh, speed as well? So like short runs, so your whole your whole training for that day would be specifically short runs to, to gain more speed? Yeah. And that'll be kind of like earlier on in my training plan, I'll do uh, what I call short intervals. And they're usually, they can range anywhere from like 30 seconds to up to around four minutes where I'll be doing like a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. So let's say they're one minute long intervals. I'll be running very hard for one minute and then I'll be jogging slow for a minute and then doing hard again for a minute. And, you know, I'll do like uh, I'll start out usually with around like 10 to maybe 15 minutes of total volume at that intensity and then build up on that throughout the course of maybe four or six weeks to where I hit maybe 30 minutes of total volume at that intensity over the course of a week, usually split into two sessions. And uh, the other thing I'll usually do during certain phases as well is I'll do a lot of those higher intensity stuff on a slight incline or an uphill because since running a hundred miles is slow enough, you don't really have to worry too much about kind of developing or maintaining a high, high leg turnover the way you would, if you're going to like try to race something shorter, like a three K or a five K. So 
doing them uphill, I still get all the benefits I'm looking for, but I reduce the injury risk by reducing the impact that's going to occur. Um, and there's also some strength adaptations that are likely going to occur from running on an uphill versus on a flat, something like that too. So there's a, you know, there's a few different ways to do it, but that's the way I kind of like. And what about nutrition? Uh, do we intermittent fasting with a ketogenic diet? So the whole kind of classic thing of carbo loathing, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think when you get into distances that are like really long, like a hundred miles, you're running at a very low intensity. So you definitely opens up the opportunity to fuel in a variety of different ways. Uh, cause it's not something like that's pinned to this very precise intensity where if you don't get the fuel in fast enough, you're going to pay for it down the road, or there's too many steps to say, convert fat into an energy source that's usable at the rate at which it needs to be done. So, um, you're going to see a variety of different fueling strategies within the ultra marathon community. And a lot of people are going to still follow what, like a moderate carbohydrate approach, just because that's what most people are doing. So like their entry to the sport kind of pins there. A lot of the endurance research and uh, fueling practices are kind of anchored in that philosophy. So most people, myself included, like kind of began there. Um, what I realized though, as I kind of got into ultra marathons was that there's the fueling in your day to day, and then there's the fueling during the race itself. So one of your goals along with like whatever pacing strategy and like, goal times you have is to defend muscle glycogen because your body is going to only have so much muscle and liver glycogen available to it before you have to start replacing it. Body fat, on the other hand, is even the leanest athletes out there are going to have way more body fat than they are energy stored in muscle and liver glycogen. So they don't necessarily have to replace that during the race itself. So it's kind of like a free um, energy source that you don't have to replace. So you, you avoid any sort of digestive issues that can come up from trying to eat something by burning more fat. So with that, I, what I end up doing is I kind of take more of a lower carbohydrate approach to my normal training and daily nutrition. And what that allows me to do is consume less carbohydrate during the race itself. I still consume some carbohydrate during the races, but it's at a lower frequency than I was when I was say doing this on a moderate to high carbohydrate diet. And by doing that, I just avoid the, the, the digestive issues that sometimes happen in like longer races, like marathons, triathlons, and ultra marathons, where I think with the ultra marathons, the, the research suggests that like six out of 10 people experience some sort of gastrointestinal issue. And of those six out of 10, half of them have an extreme, uh, situation with that. So for me, um, I'm not the type of, uh, person who can just eat endlessly during these races without having some sort of digestive issue. So I tend to kind of try to mitigate the amount I have to eat during race day through that. When you're doing your training, how do you uh, split between training and recovery? Yeah, it's a great question. I think like this is an important question for runners too, or people thinking about coming into running because like really the goal for everybody, whether you've never run a step in your life or whether you're like me and you've been running for you know over two decades is you want to stress your body just enough so that it's forced to make an improvement or an adaptation. But then once you do that, the next step is to rest and recover from that so that that can be developed and that you can kind of go back and do that process again. So, um, you know, technically it's been like a, like a, a very long process where when I started running, you know, I might run a few days a week. I might run like 20% of what I am now because that's all it took to have that adaptation. Just like a new runner, a new runner might be able to go and run three, four times a week at a volume much lower than what I'm doing. And they're going to make improvements because it is a adjustment based on what they're currently at. So for me, the, the objective essentially is, is recognizing where I'm at and then determining how much stress I need to add in order to create the adaptation that I'm looking to get. And then uh, letting my body kind of recover from that. So monitoring kind of daily and weekly progress or stagnation or like regression is important because if I'm building up and I notice like, okay, I've had a couple of workouts in a row where I'm starting to regress. That's a sign that my body has sort of maxed out the capacity for the stress stimulus. And it's time for me to like take an easy day or a rest day or what I call like a deload week, which I'll do usually every like three or four weeks where I kind of reduce volume and intensity and let my body catch up before kind of making that next step in terms of development. Um, so yeah, everyone's going to be at a different point on what it takes to do that, dependent on where their history is in the sports in fitness in general and kind of like knowing one's history and kind of good starting points is usually the, the key there. Um, since I've been doing it for a while, that often means, you know, I'm oftentimes running, you know, hundred plus mile weeks. 
And sometimes those are even including, like I said before, like speed sessions and things like that, which are going to increase the training load to some degree. What about injuries? Do you specifically work on improving strength on some joints in the body, like knees, hips, and lower back? Yeah, I'll do like some general strength training, just that I have kind of programmed into my training. And that is more of just like a preventative measure for potential injuries that could come up or imbalances that occur from doing like a very specific type of workout more often than anything else. Uh, that I do. And then I'll, I'll usually do other things too, based on my own personal injury risk and history and things like that. I've been really fortunate from an injury standpoint for the majority of my career. Uh, so I haven't had to deal with too much historically, but I have had issues in the past with like, um, tight ankles, uh, which I've had to do some more mobility and strength work in there. Uh, I had some partial tears and a couple ligaments on my right ankle. So I've had to do more lower body strength work and, a range of motion type things with, with that area. Um, hip flexors are something that I usually try to stay on top of because, uh, like a lot of people nowadays, there's a portion of the day where I'm sitting in a chair and that kind of like, uh, folds your hips in the opposite direction in which they're going to go when you're kind of in the running position. So keeping those kind of a little bit loose and stretched and strengthened is something that I try to focus on while, while I'm uh, kind of going through the phases of training. What about clothes and especially shoes, shoe technology? Yeah, shoe technology is a really interesting one to me because it's something that has changed pretty drastically since when I first started running. When I first started getting into endurance sport, you had a variety of different shoes and they all kind of had their purposes. But one thing that I would always pay special attention to was on race day, the advantage was getting as light and uh, responsive of a shoe as you could find. So that often meant something like really low profile or something that would, they call like a racing flat or some people call like a minimalist shoe or something like that. So training your lower body to be able to tolerate that sort of footwear is definitely a process. So uh, I would spend a lot of time kind of working on developing that around 2015, 16, a new piece of shoe technology came out and it's basically a foam, that foam that kind of goes between the rubber underneath your shoe and the part where the upper starts being created um, called the midsole, that material, they developed a new technology that actually, when you push down into it, the energy return that you get back from it exceeds what you would get even in kind of like a really minimalist, low profile firm shoe. So now like racing shoes have sort of gone the complete opposite direction where now you try to kind of build up the race shoe versus build it down um, or pare it down, so to speak. So uh, that has been something where now, I guess, from a purely a performance standpoint, there's not as much of a need to develop that tolerance to like a lower profile racing flat. I still think most runners and professional runners are going to be giving themselves an advantage from having strong lower legs and things like that, because it's still an area that could break down and potentially get injured if it gets overstimulated. Um, but in terms of what you're going to put on your foot on race day, uh, what's going to get you to the finish line quicker is going to be what they call these super shoes now. So the, the hardest part about that has been just like, you know, it's like anything when you have a new product at the market, there's a brand or company that sort of has it first and they kind of have a, have a leg up on everybody. And then it takes a little while in this case, a few years to uh, have every other company that manufactures shoes to kind of catch up and also have that technology. So we definitely see a little more, um, a little more kind of like subjective, like technology-based improvements, perhaps from one product to the next or advantages from one product to the next that you wouldn't necessarily seen in this depth with like the previous types of footwear options out there, which makes the landscape a little bit interesting. And we've certainly seen a lot of records get broken, uh, especially at the Olympic distances um, because of the shoe technology. And um, other sports have seen it too. It's just interesting to kind of uh, tease out which ones did what with it. When you think of like cycling, they had you know, they went from a steel frame to a carbon fiber bike frame. And that allowed the, the cyclist to move quite a bit faster. And that, that sport kind of embraced it similar to running with the shoes where uh, swimming, they had a, this was a while ago at this point, but they had these speed suits, they call them where when you think of someone swimming, you're going to go faster. If you can kind of stay on the surface of the water versus kind of submerging under and creating more resistance from the water. So these speed suits created this little extra buoyancy. So people were just like, blasting the records with those uh to the point where swimming actually uh made them illegal in competition so they went kind of the opposite direction and said this tool is above and beyond what we want in the sport from a um from a you know i guess a record keeping standpoint maybe um but yeah so running i would have never guessed running was going to have a similar thing like that but but we did so <laughs> 
what about biomechanics? Because this plays a huge role as well. The the the, the angle of the feet and like knees and all that in order to improve, mm -hmm. like small improvements that overall help you run faster. Do you do training in these as well? Yeah, I think like just the relative efficiency of just like your form and things like that, where you know you're running in a way where you're not. Um, you know, fighting or resisting is, is going to be something to consider. So I like to look at a, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is like injury prevention. Obviously, if you're running in a way where the impact forces from running are getting sent into areas that could be problematic, like in your knees and hips and ways that aren't productive, uh, you could end up with like a knee injury or a hip injury or something like that. So there's a few things that I like to look at, which is one is kind of like the position of, um, of like the top half of your body or your head where you want kind of like this a slight forward lean. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to put you in a position to then where if you run with like compact arms and then kind of pump your arms back, but let them fall forward versus swinging them forward, that's going to kind of promote that forward lean and promote that like kind of like pushing of your chest out, which can put you in a better position to have that forward lean, open up the airway passages and things like that. And then avoiding wasting energy by like swinging back and forth very much. So watching like where the palms of your hands are in relation to your sternum, if they're like crossing over your sternum, you're probably doing a lot of twisting, which is going to be kind of like using energy to go in a direction that you're not actually trying to, in terms of making progress, uh, then kind of moving down. It's like, where is your foot landing in relation to your knee? Is it kind of coming down underneath your bent knee and being absorbed the way your body's intending it to? Or is it like out in front creating like this check mark looking stance, which is just going to send those impact forces up into like your knees and hips, like I said before. And then there's also cadence. Cadence is just like how fast your foot's hitting the ground every minute. So what we sometimes see is like, if you have like a very, very low cadence, if it starts dipping down below like about 160 steps per minute, there's a good chance you're probably overstriding and creating that kind of check mark stance or that foot out in front of knee stance. And by increasing your cadence, you can likely reduce those impacts that you're generating from or that you're sending into the wrong areas by, by uh, kind of correcting that. So like forward lean, proper arm swing, um, foot placement under knee and cadence are kind of four things that I usually like to focus on early on to kind of just check to see if I'm heading in the right direction. And, and from there, everyone is going to have somewhat of a unique form where I mean, you see like some of the like top Olympians have like this beautiful form where they just look like they're gliding over the surface. And, um, but if you like really like unpack exactly how they look and every little bit, there's going to be small little like individual characteristics that are unique to them and, you know, different discrepancies that they may have, like one leg slightly longer than the other or something like that, that creates this like relative efficiency for them versus anybody else. And then the more people you include in that, when you don't select for like the top in the sport, you get a, a wider range of that sort of thing too. Next runs, you have uh, next runs scheduled? Yeah. So I've, I have a pretty heavy racing schedule this year, actually. It's um partly a byproduct of just the last few years where a lot of races got canceled over the pandemic, which meant I was doing a little bit less racing. And then I unfortunately got injured right after the pandemic versus during it. So I had a little bit longer of a layoff between kind of getting back to my normal routine. So normally I'll race probably like six, maybe even up to eight ultra marathons in a year, but then I'll do like two or three of them where I'm like really trying to kind of push myself to the limit. Um, so this year I'm going to kind of go a little bit back towards that. So right now I'm actually doing a hundred miler this coming weekend in Huntsville, Texas called the Rocky raccoon 100. And then I'll likely do another hundred miler in March, a little more of a runnable road, hundred miler. And all of that'll be in kind of process of peaking for a hundred miler in June, where it's a really controlled environment where I'm going to try to see if I can kind of break my fastest hundred mile time and 12 hour distance. <laughs> you will for sure. <laughs>